Well, thank you everyone for being on tonight. This is the Freedom Road Socialist Organization um, study session that we're going to be having for the next few months with general members, um, as far as we know at this point. Um, and we are going to be using, as people should know at this point, um, a series that has been written and is being published um, on Fight Back News on Marxist-Leninist theory. And it comes out every week. Um, I believe on Fridays, so people should make sure you are tracking that and it's had some really, really great articles so far, um, although tonight we're only discussing the first two, so but people should be familiar and um, yeah, thanks to um, Josh Sykes for writing it for our group. Um, so tonight we're going to discuss um, parts one and two, so um, one section introducing Marxism Leninism in broad strokes. Um, so everyone who is going to be um, joining our group and then hopefully joining on a cadre level um, gets a, a clearer idea of what exactly our group stands for. And then the second section, um, which Andy is going to be presenting with me, talks about um, kind of where exactly Marxism came from and, you know, uh, kind of traces that development. Um, uh, is there anything that you want to do you want to introduce yourself, Andy? Well, uh, did, did you uh, say what your role in the group is? Oh, no, I don't think that I did. <laughs> uh, my name is Chris Lee, and I am a member of the standing committee of the Freedom Road Socialist Organization, um, and I'm also the national chair of the student commission. So for anyone looking to join um, to do student work with us, uh, you'll be seeing me even more frequently, I'm sure. And I'm Andy. Um, Andy Koch, uh, I use he, him pronouns, and I am the national organizer for Freedom Road, so I'm the staff person, um, our, our only paid staff at the present moment, and I manage our national office, which is where I'm at now. Yes, and we appreciate your hard work, Andy, because you're not just staff to us, <laughs> you're an important leader, um, but yeah, so thanks everyone for being on tonight. Um, what we're going to do is um, we'll talk a bit about the two works that we asked people to read. Um, and then we're going to, we do have a couple of discussion questions um, that we will, you know, kind of present to you folks, see if people can test their knowledge a bit, um, you know, just kind of pull out some of the big the big ideas. And then we want to hear your questions too, because I'm sure people will have come up with their own questions while reading, or maybe there are things they want to flesh out and discuss, and we're here to do that. Um, so, and then the way that you can ask those questions is uh, we are going to be kind of having a, a kind of like a speaker's list and a controlled stack. Um, you can shoot Andy, Andy K, a message with your question, um, or if you write it in the chat, um, you know, uh, I believe that he should catch it there as well. Um, but the surest way is to just shoot your question to him. And then when we get to that portion, um, we'll make sure that we get to it. Um, and just to clarify, that's in the, that's still in the Zoom chat. But um, instead of saying, uh, sending it to everyone, you can click on that drop down box and then select Andy K um, instead of to everyone. And that'll be for the, um, the Q&A section. So we don't need to worry about that yet. For sure. Yep, yep. Um, so we have questions for you and we hope you have questions for us. Um, but without further ado, okay, thank you everyone for being on. Um, so I'll open by talking about the first work, right? Um, what is Marxism Leninism introducing? Well, it introduces our series. It kind of has the, the big ideas in the first, the first work. Um, Marxism Leninism is what we are going to use to try to build a revolution, a socialist revolution in the United States, right? Um, we want to understand the world not only because having knowledge is enriching, blah, 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 um, but we believe that we actually can change the world and um, that we can do so scientifically. It's not, um, you know, mysterious. It's not going to be gifted to us by the heavens. Um, we actually have the ability to learn it. Um, we have people who came before us who did a lot of that learning. And, you know, we're going to talk about um, Marx, Engels, and um, a little bit of Lenin today. 
Um, but you know, they 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 gave us the tools, and now we're going to take those tools and with the masses um, bring uh, society and humanity to a higher stage, right? Um, so Marxism, Leninism, you know, it's a science. It's got philosophy in it. Um, so the um, when we talk about kind of what came before, and when we talk about the components that led to the formation of, well, first would be Marxism, and then it would get elevated to Marxism-Leninism um, as time went on. Um, we know that um, Karl Marx and Engels were thinkers and writers who were working off of a foundation of um, British political economy, right? Um, they were looking at the writings of Adam Smith and David Ricardo, who had some of the earlier ideas about um, not only capitalism, but the labor theory of value, right? So there were people who were writing about that even before um, Marx and Engels. Um, uh, the German philosophers, um, Hegel and Feuerbach, right? Who um, Hegel famously would, you know, kind of bring back the idea that history has cycles and advances and retreats. It's not like a straight line. Um, and Feuerbach would bring it to earth and say, well, it comes out of our concrete conditions. Um, and then the most advanced ideas of um, the early French utopian socialists, because they were talking about, um, you know, kind of the inequalities of society and how to solve them, but they didn't, you know, it was a bit on the idealist side, as people will learn in the study. Um, so they took those ideas and they advanced them and they brought them to a higher level of um, uh, understanding the world in their time, right? Um, they took the political economy and they created a critique of capitalism, right? Like what is it about capitalism that will create, you know, kind of like built-in crises, built-in exploitation, built-in deepening inequality. They figured that out, right? Um, they um, combined the best of Hegel and Feuerbach to bring us dialectical and historical materialism. Like, yes, society does have, um, you know, kind of like cycles and periods of retreat and advances, but it's not in, in pursuit of like a perfect ideal, like Hegel said, it was actually, you know, it's, it comes out of the concrete world that we are born into, right? And then, um, you know, would take all of that and turn it into, you know, kind of taking the French sentiments of revolution and the enlightenment and would talk about scientific socialism. So looking at the world as a concrete place that came first, but we can study it, looking at political economy and class struggle as the driving force of how society changes, um, and then looking at um, uh, the working class as a class that actually has the ability to um, fight for itself and to change society and bring um, you know, other classes of people along with it, as we saw with the peasant question, and we see it now in you know, other classes in the United Front, right? Um, so Marxism is a science, right? Um, it's not just a set of ideas in a person's head. It's not just a dogma that can't be challenged. It's not something that can't grow. Um, and in fact, you know, Marx and Engels would, um, they weren't only writers and thinkers, they were also organizers. Um, they would go on to become leaders in the first international. They would participate in attempts at revolution um, and they would fight even in wars to try <laughs> to try to do it. Um, and they got to witness and study, you know, um, kind of the revolutions of 1848, the um, Paris Commune, the bravery of the French workers, um, and they learned from those experiences. So it was really the social practice of the masses that was the kind of, you know, was what made it possible for any of these ideas to, you know, kind of synthesize into what was correct. It was, you know, carried out by the masses and that's how Marx and Engels would learn about the potential, right? Um, and what was waiting for us in the future. So, you know, uh, Marxism is not just a dogma, it's, it's, you know, kind of the summing up of these social practices, you know, with the, the, the forefront, you know, at the forefront of the masses um, and Marx and Engels, you know, their writings would kind of work off of that. Now, um, you know, and then, uh, <laughs> Yeah, why is this important? It highlights something that we really, really want to teach everyone over the course of this series, which is that practice is the sole criterion of truth, right? In order for us to sum up 
what happened, something has to happen <laughs> first, you know. Um, but, you know, that's not to say that we can, there's going to be a dialectical relationship between the theories that we um, can take out and bring into the world and test out, but it has to be um, based on the concrete conditions of our world, right? It's not going to, again, fall out of the heavens or be, be based on who has the best theory. Um, and when it comes to the concrete conditions of our world, you know, the world has changed since the time of Marx and Engels. You know, this is where um, Vladimir Lenin became an important writer. You know, what are the conditions of our world? Well, we're not at the beginning stages of capitalism anymore when you have kind of this early competitive, um, you know, it's, it's looking hopeful, it's looking innovative. You actually have monopolies now, like uh, capitalists who've cornered all these markets and whose greed was beyond imagination, who have gone international. Um, and now we have decaying capitalism, right? Um, we have um, imperialist, um, imperialist countries and we have imperialist um, capitalists. And that's the, the, you know, they have created a situation of, underdevelopment around the world and oppressed nations. So that is what um, we have to um, contend with. And it's what um, Vladimir Lenin looked at um, and kind of taking this analysis that Marx and Engels set before, um, you know, Lenin would go on to apply the sciences to learn about the, um, uh, you know, like what classes could lead in the, the front against the czar, right, the leading role that the workers would play, but also the important role that other classes such as the peasants would play, um, and the importance of um, anti-imperialist um, national liberation struggles, which is going to be key to, it is key to our strategy, right, and it's something that we talk about a lot. People should be familiar with the national question from our group, right, we want to build um, such a front in our country too. Right. Um, and Lenin actually, you know, Lenin with the, the, the you know, the Bolsheviks and the Russian people, they succeeded at this and they had the first socialist revolution in history. Um, and that was significant because there's a lot to learn from that experience. Um, you know, we learned a lot of the lessons of party building, you know, um, from that experience. That's why we ourselves call ourselves Bolsheviks. Um, and then there would be other Marxist Leninists who would you know, go on to contribute greatly and, or, you know, keep building this science, right? So Stalin leading the Soviet Union through um, some great challenges, Mao um, and the Communist Party in uh, China taking, you know, these lessons and applying it to, you know, very different uh, material conditions and then improving the lives of a billion people, um, producing a lot of works that we also read. Um, so, you know, it, it, this is a science that's proven and it's true and it's worked and we want it to <laughs> and we think we can have it and that's why we're trying to build it. Um, uh, why do we need it? Because it, you know, it, it's, it's the science of revolution and um, the people want and need revolution. We can't live in this state um, of exploitation and war and, you know, brutality and pandemic and, um, you know, crisis anymore. We need to to, to control our own destinies. Um, we need to take what have, you know, has been uh, kind of studied and laid out and the tools that have been given us by the writers before. Um, we also need to learn from the struggles of the um, American Marxist Leninists who came before us as well, right? And the article, you know, um, hopefully people saw the names of William Z. Foster, Mother Bloor, Harry Haywood, Claudia Jones. They're all Mar American Marxist Leninists. They all wrote um, and, you know, um, took a lot of the lessons that are specific to this country that we should learn from, um, you know, for uh, an American strategy that we want to make, right? So um, that's, uh, you know, where we're standing on the shoulders of all of the people who have come before, not just the writers, but the, the masses who fought and died for this to be a reality. Um, so, you know, we want, well, you know, the article ends talking about um, you know, we want what Mao and these other writers wanted. We want a revolution and we um, believe that we have the tools to make it happen. And that's what we're here to do. And that's what we hope people will do with us, right? Um, general members can benefit from these studies because, you know, these are, this is the line that people will be pushing with our group, right? Um, and if people want to join as cadre, then you can take these ideas and, you know, we'll push them um, you know, among the masses and, and build a party, right? So um, that's 
what I have for the first presentation. Um, and now I'll go ahead and turn it over to Andy. Thank you, comrade. Um, so the, the next article um, is uh, the historical emergence of Marxism. So Chrisley's uh, kind of introductory presentation is more about the broad scope of our, uh, our ideology. And this, um, this section is more specifically tailored to um, how did Marxism emerge? What were the historical conditions that Marx and Engels were writing under? And how did they develop these ideas? Um, we've mentioned already before that these aren't just things that popped out of Marx and Engels' heads. Um, they developed historically as a result of the development of society and the class struggles that were taking place. Um, like Chrisley said, they took the most advanced theory of their time and brought them in a, a number of arenas to a higher level. So with philosophy, Marx and Engels took Hegel and kind of uh, shifted his idealist approach to dialectics and put it on a materialist basis. In economics, they took the ideas of Smith and Ricardo to their logical conclusions, and this revealed a lot of the inner workings of capitalism. And in socialist theory, they built upon the successes uh, and struggled with the failures and kind of incorrect ideas of the, uh, the French socialists. Um, so in, um, so we're gonna start kind of in uh, 1848. So the early industrial revolution was a time of really bitter, stark inequality resulting in an international workers movement, which Marx and Engels helped develop and also lead eventually. Um, they were, uh, ex both of them were exiled from Brussels to Paris um, and then traveled to Germany um, where they led a, a group called the Communist League. This was also the year they published the Communist Manifesto, which was, um, commissioned kind of as the, the program of that organization. And they published the newspaper, Neue Rheinische Zeitung. The 1848 revolution in Germany was defeated. Um, and so Marx and Engels were uh, exiled. Um, and, and this defeat of that revolution put the revolutionary movement into disarray, um, which uh, Marx summarized and analyzed that experience in, a, um, in works such as The Class Struggles in France, um, 1848 to 1850, and also the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. What these writings, what Marx does in these writings is clarify the relationship between classes at the time, and it allowed Marx to discern who were the friends and who were the enemies of the proletariat in their struggle to transform society. And this is something that's especially relevant to, um, you know, to us today, um, but it's also a method that um, you know, all successful revolutionaries have employed, um, determining what classes and what forces are our friends and our enemies. Um, who can we unite with? Who do we have common enemies and common interests with? And who do we have, you know, uh, um, stark contradictions with. Um, and we kind of uh, sum, sum up this in our uh, group document um, class in the US and our strategy for revolution, which I think is very much worth a read. Um, so the next chapter of the story of Marx and Engels collaboration um, is the, the kind of period of the International Working Men's Association, also known as the First International. Um, so 1849, Marx is exiled from Paris and settles in London, where he stays for the rest of his life. In 1864, the International Working Men's Association, also, you know, this, the first international is formed, and Marx helped found it, wrote its program, and came almost immediately to lead it. But there was a big ideological struggle within the first international um, against utopianism 
and anarchism. So the utopian socialists, and these kind of people are still around today, and we have to have the same kind of arguments with them. But um, the utopian socialists and the anarchists advanced pie in the sky theories of what a socialist society would look like and combine this with idealist notions of how to get there. The utopian's theory was not grounded in practice or in the practical needs of the workers' movements and had now to see, had not had not seen their admirable, idea, admirable ideas realized. Um, so essentially, you know, ultra leftism or utopianism or anarchism, uh, all to one degree or another, they have a disconnect with material reality. Um, and that's something that we try to pay close attention to. Um, the next really big development was the uh, event of the Paris Commune. So in 1871, the workers of Paris rose up and took power for more than two months um, before they were crushed. Um, Marx analyzed these lessons from this historical experience in the Civil War in France. And he uh, correctly pointed out that it was the first in instance of the dictatorship of the proletariat in the real world. Um, Marx also addressed some of these issues in a work called Critique of the Gotha Program. So they, uh, both Marx and Engels, continued um, this kind of long protracted struggle with idealism. Um, and Engels wrote a very important work called Socialism, Utopian and Scientific. Um, it was significant in that it helped to popularize Marxism and explain the differences between Marxism and the thought of the utopians like Saint, Sim Saint Simon, Fourier, Fourier, and Robert Owen, who were utopian socialists. Um, and they, they all still had ideological followers participating in the First International. Um, he explained the basis of, the, of Marxist dialectical and historical materialism and how these theoretical to tools allowed the revolutionary movement to advance past utopian idealism and put the revolu revolutionary movement on a materialist foundation. Um, then our final kind of chapter. So while all this has been going on, um, Marx has been writing Capital, um, his uh, you know deep and intense a uh, study of political economy. And um, it was finally, the first volume was published in 1867. Um, Marx, with this work, gave the working class movement a rigorous critique of capitalism, how it arose historically, how it functions, why exploitation and economic crisis are at, at its core, and an understanding of how capitalism could be overcome. So that covers our, our kind of presentation section. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Chrisley um, for uh, our first kind of Q&A questions. The first two questions we're going to ask you all. And so once we ask the question, I'll, uh, if you want to comment or respond to the question, use the raise hand function. Um, so you can find that in Zoom if you click click on the little smiley face with a plus that says reactions, you can raise your hand and then that, then that makes it really easy for me. It bumps you to the top of my list and um, then I can unmute you and you can speak. We are gonna ask that um, nobody speak longer than 60 seconds so that we have um, space for everyone to participate. All right, thank you very much, Andy. And again, we're going to get to people's own questions that they have as well, but you know, we'll start by pulling out kind of the main, the main concepts. So the first question, I've thrown it in the chat. Why is Marxism-Leninism the only theory that has produced successful socialist revolutions? Um, what gives it that quality? And you know, there's not like a single perfect answer or anything. You know, people can talk about kind of different aspects, um, but why Marxism-Leninism? What's so what's so great about it? And then Andy, if you wanna call yeah, on people. Got, 
we've got some hands, so I'm going to unmute Jules. Howdy. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yeah, go for it. Awesome. I think that uh, the, the two things that come to mind, we were just talking about socialism, utopian, and scientific. I think that's the most important thing is that it's grounded in dialectical and historical materialism. So there's a good understanding of the past and of the present, the economics, the political economy of how things are material ha materially happening right now and the forces that are in contradiction right now and what that contradiction looks like and how to resolve it. I also think that a really important thing, and this was talked about in uh, the, the first reading is uh, the, the reliance on theory and practice, revolutionary theory to guide revolutionary practice and then revolutionary practice to uh, be critiqued by and improved on with revolutionary theory again. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to unmute Brian. <clears throat> uh, yeah, uh, building on that, like the, uh, the fact that it's so, um, the emphasis is so strongly on like evidence based and uh, like practice based methods makes it, um, makes Marxism and Marxism Leninism like very moldable obviously to like the current times and that's actually like that's the foundation of it like the fact that you can read like Huey Newton and the Panthers and see the clear through line you, all the way back to Marx and then through Lenin and through Mao um, shows that it's it's like a platform with tools and a way to guide thought but not prescriptive um, and that makes it very uh, adaptable to individual uh, circumstances. Okay, Jason. Uh, yeah, I think I would add oh, the last two people. Yes, that's some great things. Um, the biggest thing for me is, like some others have said in different words, um, it takes the material conditions of wherever you are. So like, the Bolsheviks did not have the same conditions as the Chinese revolution that happened afterwards or Cuba, which started as a nationalist revolution. Like they all had different conditions, which dictated how one would go about getting the people on your side, um, which really involves, you know, listening and talking and dialoguing with them to say that the ideas that are here, the superstructure as Marx would call it, come from the fact that you are producing and working in a certain way for someone else's benefit. And so it starts to interrogate the entirety of the structure that you're in and the conditions that you live to say that maybe something can change or that with enough praxis, it will change eventually, the historical part, the Hegelian part of it. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'm gonna unmute um, Ryan. Hey, um, so I think what I would add to that is um, when we're not just talking about like Marxism or Orthodox Marxism, um, but like Marxism, Leninism in particular, um, I think that actually in the article, there is a really poignant quote by Mao um, who said, without a revolutionary party, without a party built on Marxist-Leninist revolutionary theory and in the Marxist-Leninist revolutionary style, it's impossible to lead the working class um, against defeating imperialism and its running dogs. Um, and I think one of the things that Marxism-Leninism in particular um, really did to move the science forward was um, apply the, the idea of, of Marxist science broadly to the new conditions that we face in, in an imperialist world. Um, and I, I think in general, um, when we look at Marxism Leninism as that continuation of um, Marxism in the modern era, it's just um, more so than any other um, doctrine out there, it is the, um, the expression that has really carried the, the legacy and the learnings of the concrete revolutions of the last 150 years ever since Marxism was a concept. Thanks, Ryan. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're gonna do um, three more and then we'll move on to the next question. Um, Alex. Yeah, 
Um, I think I'm kind of starting to uh, do different rephrasings of the same answer now, but I am, it, it's the, I guess another way of thinking of the, it being scientific versus utopian uh, thing is that in the same way that the, the scientific method that we learn in school is self-correcting because other people have to be able to repeat your experiment and reproduce your results that um, because uh, Marxism places the material before the ideal that um, it's, it's evidence-based that um, everything in theory is constantly being tested in, in practice. Great, thank you. Okay, Sam. Um, so I wanted to build off what Alex said, actually. Uh, so yeah, with that scientific method, it's not just that we have those revolutions that succeeded, we also have ones that didn't. You look at like Grenada or Madagascar, who had these vaguely left-wing liberal revolutions, but because they were not properly formated, formulated, they did not have a mass line. They weren't, um, you know, necessarily adhering to Marxism, Leninism, that they eventually collapsed. Grenada had internal conflicts that led to a coup that the United States took advantage of, invaded uh, Madagascar ended up in financial ruin because the, I forgot his name, Ratsiraka did not adhere to a socialist model and began taking loans from the IMF. And that the fact that we have those control groups that had the revolutions, but did not adhere to Marxism Leninism shows that the Marxism Leninism is the way to succeed. In my opinion, at least. Great, thank you. Um, Eric, and this will be the last on this uh, question. Hey, so um, yeah, uh, it, these are all really great summations and it really shows that people really have done the reading here, which is, which is awesome. It's a great way to start out. Uh, I wanted to, the one thing I wanted to point out is that, is that uh, in, as Marxism Leninism has developed, there's always been uh, corrective tendencies that have uh, sort of sprouted up through struggles. Like, uh, you know, it was mentioned before by, uh, by Andy and Chris Lee that, uh, that uh, Marx had to wage struggles in the first international against utopian socialism and anarchism. But, you know, the, the hallmark of, of, of trying to maintain Marxism Leninism as an analytical tool and, uh, you know, that, that, that goes down throughout uh, all the other uh, authors and, act and revolutionary activists that we've mentioned. You know, Engels, uh, towards the end of his life, was polemicizing against the biggest Marxist party in the world at the time, which was the SPD, the Social Democratic Party in Germany. You know what I mean? And he was, uh, he was going up against a persistent theory that still is around to this day, the idea that there is a non-revolutionary path to socialism. You know, and then um, right. after the October Revolution, after um, that's a minute, after yeah. uh, after Stalin died, after uh, Khrushchev took over, there was uh, they went on the path of uh, of revisionism. You know, and then there was a corrective tendency that the Communist Party of uh, of China and the Party of Labor Labor of Albania uh, went to try to combat uh, combat rev revisionism, and then the Filipino comrades took it up. You know, right. and Thanks, uh, you know, so this is so yeah. So this is this is something that, uh, that, that, that if if applied correctly, will will guard against you know revisionists going off the rails. So, thank you. All right, great answers. I definitely appreciate all. Yeah, those were really fantastic answers. Um, you know, I I, I really like the using the example of the scientific method and explaining what exactly it is that we do when we are testing out line, that's the same concept behind it, right? Because um, we want we want um, facts, fact-based results, right? Um, you know, 100% agreed with people that it's, you know, about taking the material conditions of when, you know, our time place, um, our time and place in our material conditions um, creating a strategy based on that, using every 
lesson that came before us um, and having a revolution with it, right? Yeah, 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 people's answers are good. Okay, so next we'll have um, the second question. And then after, you know, kind of taking some answers on that, we'll open it up to everyone else's questions. So here is the second question. And I'm sorry, you know, if people think these questions are basic. I'm seeing that people are really on the ball in this call. Um, we're just trying to pull out the key concepts and make sure that those are clear. So the second question is, what is the relationship between the social practice of Marx and Engels and their theories slash writings? Why? You know, did there, were their views static from beginning to end? They just had all the answers immediately. Did anything change along the way? Improve, deteriorate. Okay, looks like we got a hand. Okay, and anyone who didn't already comment, that's gonna be the trick here. Both, uh, both Ryan and Brian um, spoke for the last question, so we're gonna, um, we're gonna wait until somebody who didn't speak on the last question wants to raise their hand. So uh, anyone who didn't respond to the last question, it's now your time to step up and take a whack at this. Yeah, you get to skip the line, like fast pass in Orlando. Oh no, is it a hard question? Is it a hard question? <laughs> okay, Rashad, I'm gonna unmute you. Um, how much time do you get? Like a minute? Anyway, the, yeah. the, the main thing is um, that a lot of people, the, the main thing is that the experience changed their, made their ideas sharper over time. If you compare, for example, the writings of say Ingalls this towards the very end of his life, like in some of his letters when he's talking to Bloch or whatever about historical materialism and compare it to the communist manifesto at the time from 48, them being able to see the developing contradictions from the failure of 1848 to the Paris commune to eventually what was starting to develop in Russia and the question of the, of the peasant agrarian question is that the, their ideas had to be sharpened through actually seeing what was going on. They couldn't stay in the same, for example, in the same ideas about what it would mean to see state power. You even have Marx saying that, okay, yes, the Communist Manifesto is right in essence, but it can't be that we just seize all the state material you have to, in a sense, change it. And, and that's what the Paris Commune didn't exactly do, is that they just took all the stuff, but they didn't exactly transform it. So there was still some degeneration that, that allowed them to be overthrown. So it was very important, basically. Great, thank you. Um, and um, so if we don't get any other hands that haven't spoken before, we will go to Brian, um, but I see uh, Richard did not speak on the last one. So Richard, I'm gonna unmute you. Yeah, um, I think what uh, Shah just said made a lot of sense. And I think someone touched on this before in the last question as well, but like the importance about the relation between practice and theory and the writings is that basically practice and like revolution is like the laboratory of the theory, right? The theory is where you come up with the ideas of what might be possible or might be done. And practice is when you take those ideas and test them out in the, in the material world with the people, with the masses and with your comrades. And the relationship to that is that you take what works and you bring it back and you refine it and you work on it more what can you add that you didn't add before and you discard what didn't work and you have to keep doing that criticism of your theories and your practices um and i think that's the importance of their relationship you can't do one without the other and one informs the other absolutely and that's why we as an organization put such a emphasis on um you know doing on the ground work um, among the masses. 
um, it's, I'd say, a, a strong majority of the work that we do. Um, all right, so I'm going to take Brian. Um, Brian, go ahead. Did, did you um, did you still want to speak? Okay. I'm clicking the ask to unmute. Okay. I got it. Um, yeah, I mostly raised my hand to, just to get stuff uh, going. But I'll just say, like, yeah, it's uh, mostly on the, uh, uh, the fact that there was the uh, direct, like, experimentation and learning from that and adapting, but also, um, you know, through, like, the... Uh, internationals and the and the communes uh in, in addition to just like the actual revolutionary practice there was also like an it was an intellectual like free-for-all whether uh you know about um the utopians and the anarchists or like angles um utopia or socialism utopian and scientific is actually like a part of his larger um rebuttal of the uh, you know anti-semitic idealist um socialist uh named uh during um, and so like they really cut their teeth against um, these other combating theories of socialism and their ideas won out in addition to the revolutionary practice. All right, thank you. Um, and we'll do one more on this question, Jason. Uh, I'm gonna speak more on like the philosophy side of it because that's my wheelhouse. Uh, I think what could illustrate this question well is like the difference between Marx, Engels, and Hegel. Hegel idealism and their inversion to materialism. With Hegel, we see this huge historical mission for some spirit to further embody itself in a nation which cares for everybody. Ultimate freedom, woohoo. But without the materialist understanding and an understanding of how different countries work with other countries, on an international scale and how they even produce or what they produce, you, you, you just get what people are talking about, what the kings or the capitalists or yada, 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 what they promote as the ideals of the nation summed up in a constitution. But that doesn't tell the whole picture as we can see in like America, definitely not telling the whole picture with our constitution. Um, and so their theory, which essentially is materialist Hegelianism, takes it and then words, I'm not great with words. Adds the necessity for empirical investigation. Because without it, then you are stuck with the sort of utopian idealist that you go yada, 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 it's gonna get there, woo -hoo. All right, but thank you. Um, period. <laughs> All right, uh, Josh, I'm unmuting you. This is this is the author of the articles, everybody. Um, yeah, I just want to add one point that about the theory practice uh, thing. The big thing in, in the struggle against the utopians and the anarchists and everybody else is. Um, the Marxists were able to prove it in practice, right? Uh, they took their ideas out to the people, uh, uh, carried them forward, convinced people to, to uh, be mobilized, to take action uh, based on those ideas and proved it. Um, whereas uh, the anarchists and the utopians weren't able to do that. Um, and there's a struggle for summation uh, that takes place there that they were a part of uh, to say these ideas, it wasn't just polemics between one set of ideas and another. It was based on things that were really happening, successes and failures, and, and trying to analyze why those things succeeded or failed because everyone was interested in them succeeding. Everyone wanted them to succeed and needed them desperately to succeed. That's all. Thanks very much. And thanks for writing these. These are great. Thank you. Um, so um, now we're going to move on to general Q and A. So if you had a uh, a question about the readings, like something that um, you felt like uh, you know uh, wasn't kind of firmly settled from just the texts, 
um, of the articles, or if you had a question about um, a related idea, um, now is the time to, uh, to ask that. Um, and then Chris Lee and I, and maybe Tom, um, if he feels like it, uh, will respond. Um, so to, to submit a question for Q&A, just go down to your Zoom chat um, and then select me as the recipient, not everyone, um, just to keep the, the chat uncluttered. For sure. So send them in. Thank you, Andy. And then um, I wanted to share too, I was trying to find out what essay it was. I don't believe it was Communist Manifesto, um, but there is actually a work in which, and maybe if someone can find it, they can win my eternal gratitude. <laughs> I'll do you a favor. Um, there's, uh, there's something in which Marx actually, he's writing about the Paris Commune, and he's describing kind of like the bravery of like the workers and you know they're pioneering something that just has like blown the mind and this is you know another benefit to being a marxist leninist you actually learn things <laughs> from new events that happen in the world you're not like dogmatically opposed to them and you know refuse to factor them into your thinking he actually wrote um i have to paraphrase because i couldn't find the original thing um uh yeah yeah marx writing on the paris commune um that you know if he if you'd asked him if the workers should do it at the beginning he would have said no it would have been too dangerous but then they did it <laughs> and then they showed the whole world you know like what it would look like um if the the workers armed themselves and and you know took took power and tried to um you know kind of uh defend that power right and then that was something that you know marxists kind of took and learned from and you know um others would lag behind but so that just kind of popped i wish i could find the the, it, the text it, but it, yeah so chrisley it looks like josh says that that's um that quote is from the the civil war in france perfect thank you yeah and so we've got a couple questions um so um the first is from jules um so chrisley mentioned a modern day peasant question or classes to work with the proletariat. Um, what are these classes and why? Oh, I can answer that question. Um, so our strategy that we have as FRSO is we wanna build a strategic alliance between the multinational working class and the oppressed nations of the United States. And in our documents, um, and people should definitely check out our documents and our new sections of the program that we drafted at our Congress if they haven't seen it. Um, we state that there is the oppressed nation of Hawaii, there's the um, Black Belt South, and there is the, um, the Chicano Southwest, um, which also has named itself Aslan, right? There's, there's actually a consciousness of a lot of people there of, of the, this land called Aslan, right? Um, so, and that includes, um, you know, multiple classes, right? That, you know, like there will be, um, you know, a national bourgeoisie that will, you know, also want to get rid of the power of the imperialists, um, but maybe they have a different vision of what should come after, right? There'll be the, you know, working people of, um, you know, different, you know, kind of like small business owners too. And yeah, different classes basically. And we think that they can be united against um, the, the imperialists along with the multinational working class, right? So those are kind of the two, the two big classes that we're talking about in our strategy. But we also, you know, we want to build a united front against imperialism, um, you know, across, you know, like, you know, like what there is different social movements where you'll have people in different classes as well, right? Like um, you'll have you know, intellectuals who are in the anti-war movement and we want to organize them too, right? So, but so there's our, there's the strategic alliance, which um, we're working really hard to build and then we also you know we think that we're going to need a united front against imperialism at the end to really get this revolution thing going hope hopefully that helped great um so the next question that we've got um is from drake um said that you mentioned US revolutionaries like William Z. Foster, Mother Bloor, Harry Haywood, and Claudia Jones. Um, 
any specific writings of theirs that you would recommend. Um, so I personally would recommend from, and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll put this in the chat. Um, it's not links to the full things because I'm, I'm not sure if all of these books are available entirely online. Um, but for uh, Foster, um, American Trade Unionism is a great book. Um, and also he wrote The History of the Communist Party of the USA, um, which I have a copy of. Um, Mother Bloor um, uh, wrote an autobiography called We Are Many. Um, and it's a kind of biography of her autobiography of her life as a organizer and leader of the Communist Party. Um, that one you might have to get a, a hard copy. Um, Harry Haywood, we, we always recommend his uh, Black Bolshevik, um, which is also an autobiography of his, um, but is just a fantastic uh, book that talks about his early life, but also his whole political career um, and uh, fighting for a correct understanding of the, uh, the Black national question. Um, and Chrisley also says Negro liberation um, which goes more detailed into the African-American national question as well. Um, and then does anybody have a, um, uh, a recommendation for a, uh, a book uh, on or by Claudia Jones? Chrisley, you got one? Go for yes, it. Yes, I do, because um, we actually just read that in my own city with a bunch of activists. Um, oh, I don't know the title off of the top of my head. Um, I'll, I'll pull it up and then share. Oh, it looks like Josh has suggested some as well. Beyond Containment. Thank you, Josh. And let me pull out the one that I think it was not necessarily a book that we read, but a series of essays. But I think they must come out of a book. Um, and also, uh, Ashley mentioned um, to the left of Karl Marx is a, um, a, a, a biography of, of Claudia Jones. Um, and the, the book takes its title from the fact that she was buried physically uh, in the plot next to Karl Marx's grave in Highgate Cemetery in London. Um, all right, um, and Zoe, thank you, Zoe, um, dropped a link to the um, uh, to the Mother Bloor autobiography. Um, then that was published in 1940 um, from international publishers, the the CPUSA's thing. Um, also, uh, Chrisley mentioned um, an end to the neglect of the problems of the Negro woman. Um, was a uh, is that an essay or a book? Um, that one is an essay. Oh, I think this one is a book. Is this one a book? Are they both essays. Yeah. And the 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 book that Josh mentioned, Beyond Containment, is a collection of essays um, by Claudia Jones, and is worth um, checking out as well. So I think um, we've got all those. Um, okay. okay, yeah, great. Um, so next question um, comes from David. Um, so on the withering away of the state is the notion that changing the ownership of the means of production will gradually shift relations of production in such a way that the state becomes unnecessary. I read Lenin's State and Revolution some time ago, but it's hard for me to imagine this process, not because I don't agree with Lenin, but because the process is hard for me to grasp this shift. Um, so I can, I can speak to that. Um, so I think um, we, um, uh, yeah, so an, an important concept with this is that it's, it's not the, the process of the withering away of the state 
and the transition to uh, communism, or what we call, you know, which is defined as a, a stateless, classless society. It's not, it doesn't just happen automatically by the proletariat seizing power. Um, there's a couple of related processes that have to happen. So we have to have, um, uh, you know, an expansion of the productivity of society. So there has to be more wealth produced more easily. Um, and that kind of solves the problem of scarcity. Um, and, uh, and this leads over a long period of time um, to the dissipation of classes. Um, so, uh, and this is, this is the role. So the role of the party um, uh, under capitalism is to build and lead the working class and the oppressed peoples in a revolution. The role of the party under socialism is to continually steer society uh, towards communism. Um, and we don't have, you know, practical experience um, with this. Uh, you know, there, there hasn't been a society that's achieved communism yet, um, but that is our goal. And it's something that happens very gradually with the, um, you know, the expansion of the productivity of society, like the, the, the uh, you know, the, the rule or the, the law that Marx kind of theorizes for communism is from each according to their ability to each according to their need. Um, so that you, you know, you work at what you want to do and what you like to do, and you'll receive from society, from the products of society, whatever you need. And um, not only does that require, uh, you know, a socialist system of distribution that's very egalitarian, but it also requires a very high technological level and a high productivity. Um, is there anything else that um, other that Chrisley you'd like to add to that or Tom? I could add. Yeah, yeah. At this, um, so you know, we're still talking definitely in the U.S. about just seizing the state, right? So just having that socialist revolution. Um, and then there are countries such as China that have seized the state, and now they're trying to, you know, resolve the primary contradiction of their society, right? Um, and they, you know, in doing that, they will be able to change what contradiction is primary, and then be able to tackle, you know, kind of new, new questions and new contradictions, like you said, Andy. Um, so at this point in time, you know, under socialism, you know, we would still say, um, uh, uh, um, from each according to their ability to each according to their work, we do still, you know, people do still work in the in the socialist countries that exist today because we haven't achieved that <laughs> that situation yet where classes are no more, right? Um, so yeah, yeah. Thank you for making that distinction, Andy. And that's the thing that we have in common with the anarchists is we we both want to get rid of classes, right? Like, you know, that's why we can actually unite with them on a lot of things in in practice in the world, but we have a different vision of, well, what the role of the state is, you know, they think we can rush the process and just abolish the state because we say it's not around anymore. We actually say, no, we, we need it in order to change the, um, you know, the means of product, to seize the means of production and change the relations of production. But Yeah, and just um, kind of two, two more points just to summarize. Um, so the Marxist understanding of the state is that it is a, uh, a, a tool of uh, forcible coercion by which one class oppresses another. Um, so as long as there are classes, as long as there are different classes in society, um, that the state will exist. Um, and under socialism, the state exists to prevent the restoration of capitalism, essentially to oppress the bourgeoisie um, or people who would want to restore capitalism. And also Josh makes an important point um, about the threat of external imperialist uh, threat. Um, so, you know, uh, as long as there are imperialist countries in the world that want nothing more 
than to destroy and undermine the socialist countries, a state, uh, a socialist state, a workers' state is absolutely necessary just to defend their very existence, let alone, um, you know, uh, continue the revolution towards communism. Um, and we've seen, we're seeing, um, so yeah, I wanted to thank Rashad for the comment um, uh, that the, uh, the Black Belt thesis has shifted to the new African independence movement. Um, also, the, uh, uh, on the African-American uh, or Black or new African national question, um, a lot of people are recommending Frank Chapman's book, um, Marxist-Leninist Perspectives on Black Liberation and Socialism. Um, that was lit, written by one of our leading comrades, and we, you know, highly recommend that. Um, and then, so we have one more, uh, another question, and maybe we'll take one or two more questions uh, after this, um, if folks have any. Maybe try to wrap up around 8:15, 8:20. Um, so. Richard asks, what Marxist communist movements in the American context have inspired or influenced Frizzo, how they have furthered the Marxist tradition? Chrisley, go for it. This is a really hard question to answer because there are so many. You know, there's something to learn from you know, pretty much everything um, that happens. But, you know, like, uh, I'm glad that Frank's book came up because he actually writes extensively about, you know, um, kind of not only like the, the earliest days and what came before the Black Liberation Movement, but what was the role of the communists, you know, kind of like in different points in time um, in relation to that. And, you know, the they, we're supportive, obviously. We were, we were supportive, right? Um, let's claim it. We're communists, right? Um, and that, you know, like everything from like the German communists who fled <laughs> after 1848 and then were fighting for workers' rights in the U.S. and were anti-slavery to, you know, the Marxist-Leninists in the CPUSA who um, said, you know, fuck Jim Crow, like unions need to have both Black and white workers in it. Um, you know, those are, we've learned so much from, from those, um, those movements, you know, that said, we do think, you know, that the CPUSA has, um, you know, become a revisionist group. And, you know, that that's why they haven't, they're not uh, leading a party in the US today, you know. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, you know, the Black Liberation Movement, like, you know, the, the fight um, of like, a, Chicano and Filipino farm workers and the, there's just so many um, the workers movement the women's movement I'm not going to list all of them <laughs> on this call but there's you know the 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 authors who were mentioned previously are a good place to start um, and I also I wanted to uh, respond to the comment about the Black Belt South thesis too I don't know if now is the time Andy you can let me know if maybe you right. want me to sure bring it up later mm -hmm. No, go for it. Okay, so we we don't think that the theory is um uh, has changed or is irrelevant. We actually think that there's still a concentration of African Americans, um, and you know, uh, you know, with like in in some places the majority of the population in the South, and I don't have or in parts of the South, and I don't have the map on me, but um, you know, in fact, the there was a time when that concentration was changing a bit and people were moving out of that section, but that's actually not the case. Even now, a lot of African Americans are kind of coming back with um, kind of the change in the economy after the 50s. Um, and what it means is, you know, there's still a demand for control of the courts, control of the police, control of the economy, control of, um, you know, schools and society, right? Um, there's still a national question in the South, basically, right? But we also have demands, too, for um, oppressed national minorities, which would include African Americans who don't live in 
the black nation, right? So, you know, um, demands for full equality and everything, right? If you are African American and you live in um, like Chicago, for instance, right? Um, and this is laid out in one of our pamphlets on our website. Um, and the reason that it's important to say that there's a national question, you know, there, there was a polemic written, I'm not gonna go into the details of, you know, the, the groups of the time, but Amiri Baraka wrote an essay um, and I won't find it right this instant, um, but it was critiquing the idea that the Black Belt Nation was gone, wrong again, thank you, was gone and now it's everywhere. He said saying that it's everywhere is just another way of saying that it's nowhere, you know? Um, and that, that I thought was a pretty compelling way, you know? So you, you, can, you can have the, the national question with this concentration in the South, but also still oppressed national minorities living in other parts of the US, you know, those things are true at the same time. Um, do we have any more questions? Oh, and I, I also wanted to drop um, just three, um, three shorter readings that were mentioned in the articles. Um, so the, the one that really kind of is the kind of basis for the first article, um, or one of the large basis for the first article uh, by Lenin, three sources and three component parts of Marxism. Um, then, of course, if you haven't read it yet, we do rec we recommend, um, and you're interested in reading it, uh, to read the Communist Manifesto if you want more um, things. And then also a good reading is Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific. Um, but before you get into any of those things, we, we want to plug our uh, Freedom Road program. Um, and that can be found at frso.org slash program. Um, I didn't make it a link. And we actually have a, um, thanks, Chrisley. Um, we have, a, a, you can download a PDF that um, uh, combines the introduction, capitalism, and socialism sections. Yeah, absolutely, Andy. Thank yeah. you so much for those plugs. Are there still any questions that people had? We are here, we're at your disposal. And Rashad, thank you for that information. Um, we'll, we're, I'll, we'll look into that. Um, I, I wasn't aware of the, the declaration, but um, we'll, we'll look into it. Yeah, that's a, that's a group that we actually like a lot, the Malcolm X grassroots movement. Um, they're excellent. And they've had um, pretty important campaigns for democratic rights. Okay. All right. Chrisley, are you are we good to um, yes wrap up here? I, I just, think we are. I want to mm -hmm. thank everyone for participating and uh, answering the questions, doing the readings, asking your own questions. Um, we're going to be doing another one of these in uh, two weeks. Um, and let me pull up. Um, well, you can you can check our posts, and you'll get emails and texts about it as well. Um, but the next uh, article that we're going to be discussing, I believe, is um, on Lenin. Leninism, yep. So Leninism, I think the title is Leninism, the uh, Marxism of... The current era. Yeah, the Marxism of the current era. Um, so thanks for everyone for participating. and. You know, we want this to be, um, you know, to be more than a reading group uh, or more than just a discussion. 
um, you know, we want to arm you with these tools, these theoretical tools, you know, just like kind of one of the constant themes of both these articles, um, you know, is that we have to, we have to test this theory out in practice. And that's what Freedom Road is all about. Um, so if you are located in an area that has an active district organization, um, you know, we do encourage you to, uh, you know, to start uh, participating in mass organizations um, in those areas and talk to your local leaders, um, you know, if you're interested about um, becoming a cadre member, um, which is a, a membership level of, you know, greater uh, kind of greater investment and commitment, um, you know, required uh, mass work. Um, and political activity, um, just, uh, you know, we wanna build this revolutionary party. So thanks for everyone um, for participating and we'll see you in two weeks. <laughs>